All right, cool. So, something different. Uh, thank God. Well, it's always something different. Uh, today, Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology. So, there's a lot here, just in the title alone, uh, but also in the author. So, Sarah Ahmed, I've done another one of Sarah Ahmed's books here. Um, differences that matter. She's had a very exciting uh, go of things in her career, that is. She's resigned from her posts in uh, academia due to the mistreatment or non-treatment of uh, sexual harassment by professors and and others alike, uh, or by just staff generally, which is a very bold thing considering, you know, the uh, reputability associated with those kinds of positions and for her to give it up is a pretty big deal um so she's you know written she's a pretty prolific writer uh she's written i don't know probably 10 10 or so books or not quite 10 um anyway so the 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 other one i did differences that matter was her first one and i've jumped i've skipped one because i haven't read it yet uh her oh the cat (laughs) deal with the cat yeah, so her strange encounters I've yet to read, and now this one, or and then her cultural politics of emotion, obviously, which I have only a vague familiarity with, and then queer phenomenology. So, given the title of this book, well, this title of this book demands some clarification. So, it is both a process of queering phenomenology and recognizing how phenomenology can uh, be queer, what that would look like. So what is phenomenology? That'd be a good place to start. Um, And any hardcore phenomenologist who might listen to this would be ready to tear me apart for providing any kind of definition because phenomenologists can't agree on much uh, about what it is. So I'm going to be as vague as possible. And, well, I will try to locate uh, some kind of phenomenology that would relate to this. That is Sarah Ahmed's version. Um, So phenomenology is very interested in embodiment. So what does that mean? Well, firstly, it's the understanding that bodies exist in the world and bodies are sites of affect. Bodies are sites of feeling and kind of sites of earthly (laughs) or sensory perception where humans have these apparatuses to understand and take in the world that then affects them to some way, in, to some extent. And this, I'm being very vague. So in that sense, there is a divide between humans who perceive and the world as it is, the world being outside of the human. So the world then is only open to humans via their perceiving it. The world is then a world of appearances. So that world uh, is not some kind of objective reality. Hence, the possibility for Ahmed to posit the possibility of a, of a queering of phenomenology. Because if there was a kind of objective world with objective human uh, perception, then there would hardly seem to be a reason to try and get at something else, because we would have all the answers. So Sarah Ahmed wants to consider the extent to which our perception of the world, or our being embodied, has been influenced to some extent, by forces of uh, authority through racism or sexism, uh, patriarchal configurations, capitalism, anything like that, that alters the way in which embodiment occurs. So her book is a way by which she she's imagining us undoing that. How do we come about or how do we develop a phenomenological situation in which people are not as... Uh, conditioned by those forces or are at the very least made aware of them. So for her, because phenomenology has a very uh, white male patriarchal history, so it might seem odd then for her to cling on to it as a site of resistance. But to that, she says, page two, 
Phenomenology can offer a resource for queer studies insofar as it emphasizes the importance of lived experience, the intentionality of consciousness, the significance of nearness, or what is ready at hand, and the role of repeated and habitual actions in shaping bodies and worlds. So I haven't really extrapolated on queerness or queering as a verb to queer who which comes out of i think the person we'd credit for that would be eve sedgwick who if no one's read or if you haven't read definitely check it out eve is a or sedgwick is incredibly difficult to understand they're a pretty uh complicated writer and the ideas are not easy to grasp uh, but anyways it's not really important what they did so as Ahmed makes clear in this passage, phenomenology is about a subject, a human, being in relation to objects, things, and the world. So that sort of relationship has a strong affinity with, with queering because it does not imply a kind of innate set of you know, uh, bodily characteristics or human characteristics or worldly ones some that are susceptible to change and alteration. So in the process of, in the phenomenological process, not only is the human being altered through affect by the world, but the world itself is offered, uh, altered. So th there is a play between the two. Ahmed makes clear though, that she doesn't want this book to be the kind of textbook for this process of queer phenomenology, precisely because she wants to m remain true to that, the, these two terms. That is two terms that are always already in in motion or in flux. So while she, you know, writing this book might seem counterintuitive to that point, or might seem to oppose that point, she really wants to hammer it home that this is only one possible way to interpret it, and that in many ways, uh, precisely because of the ambiguity of the terms, queer phenomenology will take on many different forms and many different shapes naturally. And then tied to this idea of process or becoming, uh, that is the kind of ambiguity of the two terms. Embedded within the phenomenological approach that Ahmed is taking is the possibility of bodies finding home in the world that is around them. So while we might say that there is intrinsic to the phenomenological process, uh, the ability for a body, for a person to grasp the world around them, and then in turn have that world bend and shape to them, that possibility is foreclosed for some bodies, right? So if we exist in a world where space or physical space is mapped in accordance with particular um, kind of ideological frameworks, then it is that much more difficult for bodies that do not subscribe to those frameworks to feel at home in that world. So that encompasses the introduction Thinking now, or moving now into the first chapter, Ahmed sets her sights uh, against Husserl. So Husserl being one of the kind of pioneers of phenomenology, you know, uh, kind of overshadowed by Heidegger. Uh, and Husserl, who I don't know a whole lot about, sp was speaking about, you know, the transcendent ego or the kind of interplay between world and human that relied on... Um, universal human apparatuses to uh, understand and grasp the world. And in Husserl, these, uh, these possibilities are totally neutral, right? These things aren't affected by like, you know, well, okay, I don't, because Husserl writ, wrote a bunch and he had like, he changed his mind all the time. But I'm thinking of the crisis book, I think. Uh, and I don't think there's any mention about the way that culture or oppression might affect the ego, or might affect the phenomenological apparatus, but I, I, you know, I'm not doing Husserl now, so let's just think about Ahmed's critique. And Ahmed begins this chapter with one of Husserl's quotes from Ideas, and it goes as follows, on page 25. In perception properly so called, as an explicit awareness, I am turned towards the object, to the paper for instance. I apprehend it as being this here and now, this, the apprehension is a singling out, every perceived object having a background and experience, around and about the paper lie books, pencils, inkwell, and so forth. And these, in a certain sense, also perceived perceptually there, 
in the field of intuition. So for Husserl, these objects are just there, and that is all they are, objects that exist in space. Ahmed questions this neutrality of the objects, as just objects, by saying what exists behind those objects? Why are those objects there? How is Husserl capable of having a desk with objects on it that can be uh, can just be given over to his kind of thought experiment. So in her words, instead, she says, by showing how phenomenology faces a certain direction, that is in the case of objects here, which depends on the relation of other things to the background, I consider how phenomenology may be gendered as a form of occupation. So why then is Husserl interested in these objects? How is the phenomenology phenomenological project indicative of Husserl's work uh, prejudice to what you know Derrida calls a kind of metaphysics of presence to the things that are immediately in front why cannot phenomenology Ahmed asks also include the phenomenological relation between the labor that goes into those things being there or into how those things are organized or 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 whatever so one such example would be the general uh, landscape of domesticity that is required for Husserl to be able to have this writing desk with his inkwell and all that. Who keeps these things clean? Who makes it so Husserl can spend hours at a time sitting at his desk while not having to worry about, I don't know if he had children, child rearing or food or something like that. So in Ahmed's words on 30, the family home provides as it were the background against which an object, that is the writing table, appears in the present in front of Husserl. The family home is thus only ever co-perceived and allows the philosopher to do his work. This familiar place, the family home, is also a practical world. Quote, Things in their immediacy stand there as objects to be used. The table with its books, the glass to drink from, the vase, the piano, and so forth. If Husserl is facing the writing table, then this direction also shows us the nature of the work that he does for a living. It is the table with its books, which first gets his attention. So then, a little further down the page, Ahmed says, The desk that is clear is one that is ready for writing. One might even consider the domestic work that must have taken place for Husserl to turn to the writing table and to be writing on the table, and to keep that table as the object of his attention. So beginning with the genesis of this kind of phenomenological project, um, it would seem as though certain things, despite the claim that toward neutrality, certain things are just forgotten. Certain things are just not even uh, worthy of contemplation. So then we would ask, in kind of anticipation, what will that mean for the people that actually go behind making those things possible when they are trying to enter this phenomenological uh, territory? Is the world constructed in a way for them to easily melt into it, to easily become one with the writing table? Or, in the case of the writing table, suddenly will all the responsibilities of keeping that table clean, keeping the food coming, or all the um, chores of domesticity that are so often reserved for women, will all those come to the forefront? And would it therefore be discredited by the white philosopher guys precisely because that is not, you know, part of the presence demanded in the phenomenological moment. Maybe that was confusing. I could have probably worded that better. Let me try again. If women enter the phenomenological space, they do not have the privilege of just forgetting about all those other things that are necessary for the writing table to be clean, for the food to be coming, for the children to be cared for. In fact, those things might, for many of these women, become part of the phenomenal, phenomenological moment where those things are very present. They might not have like a physical tangibility, not in the way that the thing on the table would for Husserl, but they do come to the forefront. Thus, these things being objects of contemplation without subscribing to the criterion that they must have a kind of physicality that is belong to a very... Um, easily digestible system in the world, they will not be given the same kind of warrant or credit by the gatekeepers of the phenomenological tradition like Husserl. 
Or to make it even more grim, uh, Ahmed asks on 31, does the writing table have a face which points it towards some bodies rather than others? Could it very well be that in the case of women here, are they not going to be accepted by the supposedly neutral writing table? Are they not going to be accepted by the supposedly neutral inkwell precisely because they have all this extra burden? This is possible for Husserl because, or as Ahmed notes, because it demands a bracketing off. For although Husserl in 32 directs our attention to these other rooms, even if only as the background to his writing table, he also suggests that phenomenology must bracket or put aside what is given, what is made available, by ordinary perception. And this that is put aside, Ahmed tells us, is the space of the familiar, which is also what clears the philosopher's table and allows him to do his work. Then Ahmed makes a rather enigmatic claim that while in Husserl the table is that which was must, the table's function and the function required to keep the table as is, all that must disappear where only the table remains the same, um, which is, as Ahmed says, in part extraordinary given the implication that all other things fluctuate. The table is the only thing that keeps its place in the flow of perception. This already makes the table a rather queer object, which is a very interesting claim, because it would seem as though it's rigidity, right? It's being brought down to its kind of bare proponents, bare components, bare physicality, bare perceptive ethos, would make it seem as though it's, it's not very queer. Like it's very, you know... Uh, it's within normality in that way, at least how normality is structured as being a you know, normative universal thing. But she does a reversal here, which, which I like. So she says that in Husserl, everything must be uh, susceptible to flux and flow and change, except the thing that is being perceived. So Ahmed says, well, that thing must really stand outside of everything else then, and, and it's hence a very queer thing, but we'll get into that a little more later. Or it's just one more note about it. She says, being oriented toward the writing table might even provide the condition of possibility for its disappearance. So what is required for the writing table or for any other object to come into the scene? For Ahmed, this is is an ambiguous question. So she turns to Heidegger for this one, drawing upon his, uh, his illusion of throwing. So Heidegger turns to the etymology of the object when he considers how the object is, insofar as it is thrown. The word thrown risks turning the arrival of the object into an event, a happening, which is here insofar as it is now. So that d- doesn't satisfy Ahmed because it would participate in the same Husserlian forgetting of what goes necessarily into the object coming here. So there are Marxist undertones to Ahmed's work, no doubt, and she says that in the introduction that you know, she's drawing upon Marxism and psychoanalysis. So to kind of riff off that for a second, uh, the way in which the writing table is forgotten as being a product of a certain degree of labor would speak to it, uh, in Marxist terms, it's, it's fetishism, it's commodity fetishism, where it just is a thing that exists as though it just fell from the grace of God, whereas really it is attached to various... Uh, moments of labor, not only in its production, but in in its maintenance, that simply go under the radar. So thinking of the object as just there, or something that is just thrown, just falls down from the sky, not satisfying for Ahmed. She wants to think about it in terms of the histories of that thing, history or histories of that thing. Or yeah, I I forgot she actually does her own little tangent on Marx, so I don't want to steal her ideas where she says that uh, idealism is the philosophical counterpart to what Marx would later describe as commodity fetishism. I want to suggest that it is not just commodities that are fetishized. Objects that I perceive as objects, as having properties of their own, as it were, are produced through the process of fetishism. So there's there's that. I missed that one in my notes. Sorry. To provide a counter, kind of counterpoint to the Hesserlian and uh, Heideggerian positions, uh, she turns to Derrida, providing a quote of his where he says the table has been worn down exploited over exploited or else set aside and beside itself no longer in use 
in antique shops or auction rooms. So this is a, a perspective that Sarah Ahmed likes. It considers the way that objects go through various transformations and, it, and they alter and they develop scratches and scars on the surface that attest to its history. But still, for Ahmed, she's like, well, what a, how does the table go into existing and how does the table go into being maintained? Still, that is forgotten. Now it is necessary that I focus on the Heideggerian stuff again, because Ahmed sees it necessary to extrapolate on it upon presenting Derrida, who is clearly critical uh, of Heidegger all the way through his work. Okay, so in Heidegger, there is, for at least Ahmed recognizes, a little bit more of a potential for a queering, because the object is not just given over to a kind of neutrality. The object is designated by its directionality. So where the object promises one to go is is then what, you know, how it's going to be perceived as well. So then we get the example of the, the hammer where, you know, the hammer, you know, in per, uh, doing its function, not as being some kind of neutral thing, but performing what it's meant to perform, uh, disappears precisely because it's fulfilling that function. So there is in that moment the possibility to recognize the object as being determined by something, by its particular function. But that goes under the radar until the hammer breaks. So when the hammer breaks, then suddenly you're made aware of the hammer's function and the necessity for it to be uh, you know, fixed so that that function can keep occurring. But still, even this description, which would open up the phenomenological possibility to otherness, to difference, for Ahmed still is a zone of exclusivity to some extent and bars off what things mean and what they can mean. So she gives the example of a hammer being too heavy. Like, who is the hammer intended for? Where this uh, conversation of uh, functionality of the hammer or its, oh my god, or its use would give us some degree of, would move us beyond simply regarding it as a neutral object, still forgets how it's, you know, an object designed and intended for some bodies as opposed to others, therefore eradicating its, uh, or posing the question, for whom is this object reserved? Is it simply a neutral object that has been bestowed with a kind of functionality, or is it highly embedded within a particular ideological framework that must be evaluated? So in Ahmed's words on 51, Objects as well as spaces are made for some kinds of bodies more than others. Objects are made to size as well as to made to order. While they come in a range of sizes, the sizes also presume certain kinds of bodies as having sizes that will match. And one good example would be like seats on transit and airplanes and stuff like that. These uh, these seats, these spaces are not designed for certain kinds of bodies and that there then comes to uh, affect these bodies in certain ways. So despite being ostensibly neutral as just objects existing in the world, these objects are actually very much a product of a particular system that precludes po uh, certain bodies from entering that domain. So then to counter the Husserlian and Heideggerian positions, uh, Ahmed draws from, I guess would be your favorite phenomenologist, that is Merleau-Ponty who, she says, uh, considers, this is from 52 to 53, uh, Merleau-Ponty shows us bodies are not the same as other kinds of objects precisely given their different relation to space. The body, he suggests, is no longer merely an object in the world. Rather, it is our point of view in the world. So then returning to Husserl's table, we can consider how the body moves around the object, and that very motility is remarkable in its difference from that which it moves around. So there is with Merleau-Ponty, who I'm not really familiar with, uh, there is the possibility to have a dialogue with particular kinds of bodies with particular kinds of objects. So it's not as though there's a universal human apparatus for perceiving neutral objects that exist in the world. There are particular bodies with particular methods of seeing, particular apparatuses of understanding or perceiving the world with particular objects that are constructed in various ideological and cultural and social and economic and political ways that alter their meaning, that open these things up for negotiation. So how do these bodies come to exist as they are? 
So various bodies have various histories, various understandings of the world. Same can apply to objects. How do each of these things, that is, bodies that perceive and objects being perceived, how do they actually come to have be what they are? Well, drawing upon Merleau-Ponty, she says that all, uh, both, uh, sorry, they describe bodily horizons as sent- sedimented histories. Okay, so that is kind of through repetition. Then turning to Judith Butler, who speaks to this, uh, she says that it is precisely how phenomenology exposes the sedimentation of history in the repetition of bodily action that makes it a useful resource for feminism. So what bodies tend to do are affects of history, histories, rather than being originary. So it's not as though someone falls from the sky and has a set of beliefs or, uh, or anything. These things are caught up in histories, not of simply individual histories, but of histories ascribed to a certain group of people. And this, this extends much deeper than, even though these obviously play clear factors, but gender, race, sexuality, were given the kind of intersectional approach, but intersectional at a capillary level, where people are kind of um, uh, atomized, you have a number of different factors playing a role. So, you know, opinion time, it's important not to just consider like race like the determining factor, obviously, not to say that anyone does that, but that there are a plethora of other factors that influence and guide the way that bodies are going to act or be in the world. So then Ahmed gives us a rather interesting insight about the paradox of this coming into being in the world, where through this process, we enter a state of effortlessness, where being in the world is just occurs by second nature. So she says this paradox where effort become through effort one the world becomes effortless. She says this is precisely what makes history disappear in the moment of its enactment. So this gives us an idea as to why for some bodies they are predisposed to looking at the world in different ways where whosoever can look at the writing table and see a neutral object precisely because his history has dictated him uh, to view it like that. Whereas the woman, you know, putting in the labor to keep that desk clean when confronted with the writing table does not see a neutral thing. But through her history, through histories of domesticity in women, sees it as being a zone of perhaps anxiety or contemplation as to whether or not it, it... is up to par. So then what sense can we make of women who are writers? So, it, you know, just being really uh, cisgender normative here, uh, let's just talk about women for a minute. Uh, throughout history, women who have actually become writers, Ahmed says, yeah, it of course, like, you know, we have a long enough uh, human history, there are going to be examples of women being writers despite all the pressures trying to oppose that but she says funnily she's like that's exactly what they are though women writers and one way i can draw this out would be uh on jeopardy right where you have the categories where you could have a category writers that'll just be inevitably men but then when it's women writers they specify women writers as though women can't be writers they have to be women writers or you know the uh, nba just implies men whereas the women's nba implies women so there is that qualifier attached to the term that grounds kind of concretizes women within that position whereas men are free to kind of disappear into the neutrality of the term itself like the nba no one says it implies men but it does and that enters the kind of cultural imaginary so for ahmed on 61 she says The woman writer remains just that, the woman writer, deviating from the somatic norm of the writer as such. We know too that there are women philosophers and how they still cause trouble as bodies out of place in the home of philosophy, which itself is shaped by taking some bodies and not others as its somatic norm. All right, excellent. Now that'll move us into the second chapter, sexual orientation. So this is where we're going to get into queering. I think more properly. And this is apparent with, or I'll read the first uh, epigraph. Is that? I can't remember the term, whatever, for the intro quote. 
So this is Merleau-Ponty from the Phenomenology of Perception. If so we contrive it that a subject sees the room in which he is only through a mirror which reflects it at an angle of 45 degrees to the vertical, the subject at first sees the room slantwise, a man walking about it in about in it seems to lean to one side as he goes a piece of cardboard falling down the door frame looks to be falling obliquely the general effect is queer then sarah ahmed taking that up says in uh merlo ponty's text queer moments do happen so queer moments and this is a good starting definition are the moments where the world no longer appears the right way up or they appear oblique. So Ahmed then extrapolates or expounds upon this point, and I'm going to read a rather long quote and then dissect it. So by implication, the queer moment in which objects appear slantwise or oblique and the vertical and horizontal axes appear out of line must be overcome not because such moments contradict laws that govern objective space, but because they block bodily action. They inhibit the body such that it ceases to extend into phenomenal space. So although Merleau-Ponty is tempted to say is tempted to say that the vertical is the direction represented by the symmetry of the axis of the body, his phenomenology instead embraces a model of bodily space in which spatial lines line up only as effects of bodily action on and in the world. In other words, the body straightens its view in order to extend into space. So what I think Ahmed is saying here is that if we were to have somehow have some kind of neutral uh, objective view of the world, let's say I was a, a god and I was able to see how different people looked at the world. For each one of those people, the world would look straight to some extent because they would be able to navigate it. So relative to them, the world is straight. It's not oblique and it's not slantwise. But if I were to take any single one of those people's perceptions of the world and then uh, compare it to someone else's, suddenly worlds will start to look oblique, slantwise, out of shape. So there is a kind of general relativization occurring. And for some reason, I'm thinking of uh, whoever played Ocarina of Time would remember in the Forest Temple. Shit, I think it's the Forest Temple when you, you have to chase around those ghosts in the pictures and you have to go through this room that, that is like a straight, uh, it's like a big hallway, but then you hit a button and then the hallway twists and it's like a curved, uh, curved hallway and you could still walk through it, right? So it's not as though a thing being oblique makes it impossible to navigate. It's just that you have to adapt to it in order to navigate. And, it, and it's a silly analogy, but maybe someone it'll resonate with someone. So this kind of ver verticality and horizontality, you know, the creation of straight lines, is can become a process of nor uh, normativity, where the world is made um, normative, based on some people's perceptions, where some people who hold certain authority are able to govern what how others are going to engage with that world. So while the world might be, to a kind of Merleau-Pontian uh, neutral perspective, might be relative to each individual person, and all they must do is just adapt to accommodate that world, Sarah Ahmed is taking that even further, I believe, suggesting that, yeah, but we can't forget that there are forces that make it harder for other people to adapt to that world and that exclude them ultimately or are trying to. So one such way to look at it would be through sexuality, hence the chapter title. So of course, this is Ahmed on 67. When Merleau-Ponty discusses queer effects, he is not considering queer as a sexual orientation, but we can. We can turn to the etymology of the word queer, which comes from the Indo-European word twist. Queer is, after all, a spatial term which then gets translated into a sexual term, a term for a twisted sexuality that does not follow a straight line, a sexuality that is bent or crooked. So phenomenology then helps us to consider how sexuality involves ways of inhabiting and being inhabited by space. So if we draw a distinction between the heterosexual and the homosexual, we can see uh, traces of um, 
the distinction that Ahmed makes between men writers and women writers, where men writers are just writers and women writers are women writers. So for Ahmed, she says that the emergence of the idea of a sexual orientation does not position the figures of the homosexual and the heterosexual in a relation of equivalence. Rather, it is the homosexual who is con constituted as having an orientation. The heterosexual would be presumed neutral. So that, you know, that is so clear. Like, and any number of tweets online could uh, illustrate this, but how, you know, when uh, sexual sex ed curriculum proposes teaching kids about, you know, trans people, then suddenly it's like a political agenda. Whereas learning about uh, Romeo and Juliet is not, right? Like, no, that's just natural. It's normal. It's anything like that. Where the same kind of discourse, you know, I don't want to say it's totally gone, but many years ago, and I don't want to say the, the barbaric past, but when the uh, homosexuality was, you know, considered a mental disorder, it was considered uh, something that was, you know, not only politically motivated, but something that was um, ideological in that it was seen as, you know, something that had to be part of a, of a worse kind of framework, of a worse kind of system. So in the same way, I think that the same thing can obviously still be seen with homosexual people today, but certainly uh, trans people and others that don't fit within the, the binary. So in the case of heterosexuality, it is considered, you know, and the, the term straight to apply to heterosexuality, like to be straight, is no, I don't think, any coincidence. But the tr uh, transition or the displacement of one's desire or movement from one gender to the other, in the case of the, the binary, creates for Ahmed a straight line. That corresponds to the easy movement between two things. Whereas the desire for one's own gender, she says, is, um, is regarded with a logic of queerness or slantness, where to depart one's body must demand a return, so a kind of curvature back to the same uh, the same gender, which is a strange, you know, thing for, you know, people that she's calling out here. So in the case of the straight uh, movement, she says that the line of straight orientation takes the subject towards what it is not, and what it is not then confirms what it is. So that's super interesting. So it's, that's the kind of uh, structuralist argument, you know, of, of, of language, where, you know, you know that T-R-E-E -E corresponds to tree as it manifests itself in the world, because, you know, T-R-E-E -E does not correspond to dog or does not correspond to uh, lamp or whatever. Not to say that that's the only connection I can draw here, but it's just what came to my mind. So ultimately, this uh, being in line or being straight directs one's desires toward marriage and reproduction, to direct one's desires toward the re reproduction of the family line. So this line occurs horizontally, and these are uh, just, uh, this is how I imagine it, horizontally between people, like a coupling, man, woman, in terms of the binary, which then forms an that's a horizontal line, then forms another vertical line through the family line. So from there goes down to the children and then from them their children and so on. So we like to work with very clean, neat lines that communicate uh, kind of telos. So this is why queerness is so threatening because this all subscribes to the kind of Oedipal domain of you know patriarchal authority passing down the line uh, or, you know, and I'm just taking from Anti-Oedipus here, uh, where you have um, children always in the Oedipal paradigm brought back to their relationship to their parents, always brought back to that kind of originary point in the form of the straight vertical line, or vertical line, yeah. I feel like I've messed those up. What is wrong with me? Vertical line up and down, horizontal left and right. Uh, so for Ahmed, the threat of queer is a death threat Queer desires th threaten to discontinue the father's line. To bring such queer desire in line is to continue the father's line, and indeed the line of psychoanalysis itself. So this speaks to her critique of Freud, naturally, because Freud, you know, it's Freud. Um, 
always bringing things back to their kind of patriarchal origin point. So the becoming natural of the heterosexual coupling is not a, a neutral thing in itself. Rather, it has connections to various apparatuses of scientific understanding or biological understanding where there is, born in mind, taken as an axiom, the idea that children are, you know, uh, bearing children is a kind of natural thing. But surely not natural. That is what, it, it's something that can occur through the act of fucking, but it's not something that needs to happen. Uh, all that does, or all that is, is an extension of the logic of straight lines that Ahmed so um, so loathes. So, because heterosexual coupling is attached to this like child rearing, this kind of straight line mentality, then it is able to have such a strong place within the cultural imaginary because that logic permeates through all other domains of life. Or again, like in uh, with Deleuze, like in anti-Oedipus, when they say that uh, Oedipus permeates through all institutions. So it's no surprise then that Oedipus, as you know, the kind of um, way to evaluate psychosis or, or neurosis, makes so much sense to people. I think the same applies here. Not to say that this only gains credit by comparing it to Deleuze and Guattari, but uh, it's just another connection I draw. Heterosexuality in this process of becoming natural then occupies the space similar to that of the writing table as the space or the kind of maybe dining table as something that people organize around that disappears from sight until it breaks, until it stops being uh, useful to some extent. So to illustrate this, um, Ahmed provides an anecdote where she parks a car at her house, uh, a house she just recently moved into, and a neighbor says, uh, it, it, when Ahmed is with her partner, uh, the neighbor says, uh, is that your sister or your husband? Kind of butch person, I assume. Um, <laughs> so for Ahmed, this really attests to the obliqueness of uh, lesbianism, right, is not subscribing to the narrative of heterosexual coupling, unless, of course, it, it's in pornography. Uh, but two women being together is not something that, that works. So then that is fixed by the heterosexual gaze by turning it into a narrative of sisterhood or of the standard heterosexual coupling, which, you know, serves that end of normalizing uh, Ahmed and her partner. So lesbianism is just one site of queerness for uh, Ahmed is is necessary, right? Because it presents difference and it presents a kind of radicality uh, or a kind of alterity that is necessary to oppose the normalizing tendencies of the world. Uh, but this is not reserved for uh, the kind of heterosexual white male phenomenon. She also says suggests that within uh, lesbian feminist circles, there are kind of... Uh, structuring tenets within their own political thinking that try to frame things and, and grasp with things in, in certain ways. So she provides one example, suggesting that for the notion of butch femme has been the site of an intergenerational conflict within lesbian feminism, as well as between lesbian feminist and queer politics, the lesbian feminist critique of butch femme as assimilating to the model of heterosexuality as male-female has been interpreted by queer theorists as anti-sex and as a form of class prejudice against working class lesbians for whom butch femme bar culture was and is a meaningful lived reality. She continues, butch femme is not a copy of a real thing that resides elsewhere, but rather is a serious space for erotic play and performance. So here we really hear uh, Butler coming through as well. But this, this performance is really good and especially the play because it makes it... it uh, <laughs> It troubles the association between male gender markers or male gender uh, codes with men. You know, turning that gaze back on its on its uh, on its head, saying like, "Hey, I'm you know for all intents and purposes born biologically a woman, yet I can take all your codes and make them mine." So there is a disruptive act there. So despite the idea that she 
uh, picks up on by lesbian feminists, some some lesbian feminists, that the butch femme relationship is simply a, a rehashing of the heterosexual framework, there is actually embedded within it a kind of radicality that is is escapes that logic. So given all this, uh, in terms of sexual orientation, it is important, Ahmed says, uh, that we do not, on 106, that we do not idealize queer worlds or simply locate them in an alternative space. That would be to romanticize them. After all, if the spaces we occupy are fleeting, if they follow us when we come and go, then this is as much a sign of how heterosexuality shapes the contours of inhabitable or lived space as it is about the promise of queer. It is given that the straight world is already in place and that queer moments where things come out of line are fleeting. Our response need not be to search for permanence, as Berlant and Warner show us in their work, but to listen to the sound of the what that fleets. So there, she wants to maintain a degree of difference, like radicality, that opposes the logic of permanence, that opposes the logic of linearity, because that would be what subscribes to the general logic of uh, solidification or galvanization that will inevitably exclude certain bodies and people. So then from there we go move into the third chapter going from sexuality into race so titled the orient and the others and other others sorry so this first quote is by Fennel from black skin white mask and then the occasion arose when i had to meet the white man's eyes an unfamiliar weight burdened me the real world challenged my claims in the white world the man of color encounters difficulties in the development of his bodily schema Consciousness of the body is is solely a negative activity. It is a third person consciousness. The body is surrounded by an atmosphere of uncertain of certain uncertainty. I know that if I want to smoke, I shall have to reach out my right arm and take the pack of cigarettes lying at the other end of the table. The matches, however, are in the drawer on the left, and I shall have to lean back slightly. And all these movements are not made out of habit, but out of implicit knowledge. So Ahmed says of this, doing things, as Fanon illustrates it, depends not so much on intrinsic capacity or even on dispositions or habits, but on the ways in which the world is available as a space for action, a space where things have a certain place or are in place. So, and I'm reminded of another Fanon moment when Fanon says, uh, as a black man, he's not only always existing in the third person, like watching himself making sure he acts right but he is also three people and he gives the example of being on a bus that seats three people in a row and he finds himself sitting alone because no white man wants to sit with him so in that way he he says he takes up space of three people which is uh, so not just third person but i forget what what the term is but it's like he's triple personed or something so whereas in sexuality the normality was associated with heterosexuality Ahmed says here, drawing upon Fanon, that it is the white world that is the normal space. So phenomenology then helps us to show how race is an effect of racialization and to investigate how the invention of race, as it were, in bodies shapes what bodies can do. Moreover, she continues on 112. If we begin to consider what is effective about the unreachable, we might even begin to begin the task of making race a rather queer matter. So race, is, it's not as though it's just like a, a social construct, right? Because obviously all things are uh, constructed by uh, society, by science, by nature, by anything. Um, in fact, these things, precisely by their being reiterated, by their being repeated through history, come to be real. So then, not just in the uh, relationship between white and black people, but between nations and their predisposition against oriental nations or what is called the the orient uh drawing upon said so the orient being that space of the other being that space of strangeness or, or obliqueness kind of hyper sexualized uh uncontrollable other so therefore given the uh the space required to have this idea called the orient uh, Ahmed says the alignment of a race and space is crucial to how they materialize as givens, as if each extends the other. In other words, while the other side of the world is associated with racial otherness, racial others become associated with the other side of the world, 
They come to embody dis distance. And then this embodiment of distance is what makes whiteness proximate as the starting point for orientation. Whiteness becomes what is here, a line from which the, white, the world unfolds, which also makes what is there on the other side. So then she qualifies this in a good way, I think. She says, when I refer to whiteness, I am talking precisely about the production of whiteness as a straight line rather than whiteness as a characteristic of bodies. Indeed, we can talk of how whiteness is attributed to bodies as if, I, as if it were a property of bodies. One way of describing this process is to describe whiteness as a straightening device. So whiteness loves to disappear. Whiteness loves to be that thing that, because it has an association with the straight lines, uh, can then just, through its becoming normal, can then be something that is just ignored, that disappears. So drawing upon this, uh, Ahmed says that in some fantasies of interracial intimacy, the white body becomes all the more white in its very orientation towards racial others as objects of des desire. So in her work, Bell Hooks examines how the white body's desire for racial others is a technology for the reproduction of whiteness, which she describes as eating the other. So if the white body eats such others or takes them in, then it does not lose itself. The white body acquires color through such acts of incorporation. It gets reproduced by becoming other than itself. So this is a very, this is a complicated idea, I at least for me. So the idea, I think, is that uh, whiteness, not necessarily having defining characteristics, then consumes the other as the possibility of, cons of becoming something else. So this is why, you know, whiteness is so um, apt or has such a strong uh, desire to appropriate other cultures. White people love yoga. <laughs> White people love, you know, indigenous knowledge and all that type of stuff just so they can consume it, they can commodify it, you know, give themselves, affirm their own, you know, non-position, their own straightness by constantly recognizing the other. Or Baudrillard gives us a good term here that I think works uh, through museumification. You museumify the other put them in, in zones where they can be contemplated and thought of in order to only affirm our lack of that sort of identity. Which again, like as she says, this doesn't have anything to do with like white people per se, but it's the logic of whiteness because white people are obviously much more complicated. You know, various different uh, white identities trouble such a, a kind of simple understanding of it. So then Ahmed considers what it would mean to be a mixed child, drawing upon her own uh, identity as having an English mother and a Pakistani father, uh, where she asks, does the mixed child's race inherit, sorry, does the mixed race child's inheritance take the form of an approximate body as a body that looks as if it could be the child of a black parent and a white parent insofar as it mixes their colors? So she says, she, I want to suggest here that the mixed family is not easily incorporated as a social ideal, precisely because the two sides are not necessary, do not necessarily create a new line. In my experience of having a white English mother and a Pakistani father, my early points of identification were with my mother and were bound up with whiteness and the desire to be seen as white and as part of a white community. This desire can be rearticulated as the desire to share whiteness or even to have a share in it. Of course, such an image of whiteness was fantastic. The fantasy becomes binding as an effect of the identification. So she had a disposition towards her mother to be white. Of this, she asks, what does it mean to want to be white by being oriented in this way? So there, another thinker that uh, comes to my mind would be Stuart Hall, whose mother was a uh, Caribbean black, and oh, I hope I didn't screw that up. I think she was Caribbean black, uh, who resented Stuart Hall for be having blackness, right? And this had a, there was a very um, strange tension, or strange, very strong tension between the two, because she wanted to erase her kind of black history. And Stuart Hall, in his, the one documentary about him, uh, says like, "Yeah, it, my mother like seems as though she hated me for being black, like for being uh, for being mixed. That is." 
which is an interesting thing. It's funny. I could, me, a white guy. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting oh, that happened. Yeah. So this desire for whiteness in the case of Ahmed resulted in her wanting to distance herself, not only uh, metaphorically, but also quite literally from her father. But what this did open up for her was being what was kind of uh, uh, a foray into what being queer was like, being not, being in between, you know, being negotiated, being always, uh, the cat's trying to jump down. You're going to embarrass yourself. There you go. You're good. Where was I? Yeah. Uh, how her being mixed was kind of uh, her way of first understanding what it meant to not subscribe to straight linear paths, right? So while for her, the idea of blackness, she takes as being just for the sake of uh, disturbing the straight line system, um, can in itself become a straight line. She always wants it to be, you know, a site of difference or a site of, I shouldn't, I shouldn't frame it like that, but a site that disturbs the conventionality of straightness, of straight lines. She says that being mixed race is like an always, always, always oblique state of obliqueness because you are neither here nor there. You are always uh, in between. So then that propels us into the conclusion here. So disorientation and queer objects, where she starts out saying moments of disorientation are vital. They are necessary. They are bodily experiences that throw the world up or throw the body from its ground. So disorientation is the thing that allows people to move into what's possible, right? To disturb the kind of implicit associations with straightness, with whiteness, with anything like that, to open up the possibility to consider not only other modes of being as acceptable, because that would in instill a degree of permanence to them, but rather to always be on the horizon of sorts, to always be considering what um, not being what oneself is will mean. We're not being straight or not subscribing to the logic of rigidity and, and teleology and, and linearity, what that can mean. So what this might look like, and again, to avoid the ascribing narratives to things, because that would subscribe to that logic, she, she considers the table again, saying that you can't really make a table queer, because then that would give queerness a kind of face. But rather, um, the table can facilitate queer space. So this is just not about, this is on 169, this is not just about any body, but specifically a black body and a white body. Two boys. It is the proximity of these bodies that produce a queer effect. So queer tables are not simply tables around which or on which we gather. Rather, queer tables and other queer objects support proximity between those who are supposed to live on parallel lines as points that should not meet. So giving a kind of possibility to those uh, points that would otherwise have to meet through a kind of oblique this, giving them a site for them to come infinitely close to one another, right? Two parallel lines that do not meet, like an asymptote. So ultimately, a queer device, she says, is a disorientation device. It would not overcome the disalignment of the horizontal and vertical axes, allowing the, the, the oblique to open up and another angle on the world. And this works in the service of... Um, or I'll just read it. She sees a queer, or she would see queer as a commitment to an opening up of what counts as a life worth living, or what Judith Butler might call a livable life. So that pretty much rounds it off. Um, not it. It's a good, you know, it's a good book. I won't say any more about it. I hope that I captured it or remained true to it. Um, definitely go and read it. You know, don't take my word for anything. Uh, I'm a I'm a goof, so I don't I don't even know what I'm talking about. So I hope that people got something out of that, and I hope that you know if you have any questions or concerns or anything, you know you know how to comment. Uh, I don't care if you like or subscribe. Uh, do what you want. Uh, but on that note, 